Okay, welcome back to our evolution topic. We are in our fourth and final lecture for evolution, and this is one of my absolute favorite topics. Uh, it's cladistics. Um, I don't know, you'll recognize it as soon as you see it, um, but it is just such an interesting topic, and it's just a really cool way to visualize time and relationships of organisms. So cladistics is all about cladograms. So cladograms are basically just tree diagrams that show the similarities and differences of species. So a couple main vocab words are nodes. We're gonna have some more on like the next page, but so everywhere that you see a branch, so like right here you have a branching point, right here you have a branching point, branching point, branching point, branching point, those are called nodes. And nodes just so show a, an event when a common ancestor split into two or more species. So it's just where a common ancestor split. Cladograms are based on DNA base sequences or amino acid sequences. So using your genes, um, which is relatively new, right? We only knew about DNA and sequencing DNA um, within the last, let's see, 60 or so years. So using DNA is relatively new. Prior to this, they used appearance. Um, so interesting. So another, some more vocab, I guess. Um, Conograms show how species evolve over time to form new species. So there are always going to be groups of species derived from a common ancestor on a cladogram. And the groups that are derived from a common ancestor is called a clade. So you can have a small clade, right? Like lizards and snakes, just these two. Or you can have a large clade, which then has other pieces, like other nodes, other breaking points within that. So uh, it's just kind of interesting. And sometimes you can have extinct uh, clades that don't exist anymore, right? Like dinosaurs don't exist anymore. And so they um, are so present be on the cladogram because they did exist at one point, but they are no longer um, existing today. So you've got lineage, more vocab, which is just a branch on a cladogram that reflects descent from an ancestor. So lineage, lineage, lineage. Um, this results from speciation events. So it's just showing like the branches that form um, show the lineage, right? You can follow lineage from a present current organism and follow the lineage all the way back to its, you know, the oldest common ancestor. And then each lineage has ancestors that are unique to the lineage. <laughs> and each lineage has ancestors that are shared with other lineages, right? Common ancestors. So like, let's start with B and C. You have lineage B and lineage C. And then right here in this blue box, you have the common ancestor. But then you can also show the lineage, how A kind of veered off from B and C, and but you can still show that common ancestor um, that would be in this like yellow solid box. One way that we notate whether organisms are living or extinct would be how long the line is. So if you are living today, um, then you're typically all the way at the top of the, the cladogram or all the way to the side, you're, you're, you're equal with all the other ones. So like A, C, and D would be modern species, right? They're all the same length. Um, so they are modern, they exist now, whereas B stopped short. Um, so this would be an extinct, whew, extinct species. Uh, so you can represent it with a shorter line, you can represent it with an asterisk, um, you can kind of do whatever fits in your cladogram, but typically you use a shorter line. 
And then this is just an example. So this is like a real vertebrate cladogram. You can start, you would start down at the bottom here. These would be your oldest organisms. And this is the first characteristic, derived characteristic that all the organisms beyond this point in time would have this. So that means that every single organism that was gonna show up to the right of this vertebral column red line has a vertebral column. So that means this lamprey does have it, but jaws comes after the line for lamprey. So lamprey does not have jaws. So that means that everything to the right of this red line would have jaws. So then we have a shark. Well, yeah, sure, you know a shark has jaws because those are just like literally a movie called that. And then four true limbs. Well, you know sharks don't have four limbs. So that means that everything to the left of this does not have four true limbs. But everything to the right does have it. And you can keep going, keep going. And then as you go up, You'll notice that this is specific to only these two. So a hole in the hip socket means that it's like really only specific to birds and T-Rex or like a dinosaur um, because it's up here. So it does not affect anything on this main line. It only affects um, on this like mini clade. And then you can keep going and keep going until you get um, all the way to the top. This is just kind of like another one in a different way, like a different um, setup. So again, you would start at the bottom where multicellularity is like the common piece for all of them. And then as you go up, porphyrum has nothing else except multicellularity. And then you can see that like radial symmetry and two true tissues would be for nadaria. And then immediately you see bilateral symmetry. So everything else beyond this has bilateral symmetry and organ systems. And then you can kind of like work your way up, all the way up. Over here for chordata, um, a notochord and dorsal nerve is talking about a spinal cord, which is like very clearly the uh, specific trait of chordates. And then DNA mutation. So this is one way that we can actually track how organisms uh, kind of evolved and, and we can see if they are similar, if their clades are similar. So mutations in DNA that persist and are inherited occur at a predictable rate. So if um, there is an adaptation that's really beneficial, it's going to kind of predictably be inherited at some rate. So the rate at which those mutations occur can be used sort of as like a clock to calculate how long ago species diverged. So you can use the mutations in DNA. You can literally um, map out the genomes of these um, organisms and then see the differences and be able to like literally map out when exactly did this new species occur? When did it diverge? And so if the DNA base sequences are similar between two species, right? Like there's only a few mutations um, that have actually happened. That means that they diverged more recently. Whereas if there's like a ton of mutations, there's like barely any similarities left, um, then you know that they diverged longer ago because the rate of mutations, you can use that as a calculator basically. And the fact that all living organisms have DNA suggests that we all have a common ancestor, um, which is just really cool and fun to think about. So conservation of mitochondrial DNA. So this is like kind of a totally different type of DNA um, because mitochondrial DNA does not mix during meiosis and fertilization. So everybody's mitochondrial DNA is passed down directly from mother to child without modification. This is like a key piece of information. So the only way it change, it can change is through mutations, which makes it like wicked easy to track it through generations because unless there's like a crazy amount of mutations, it's going to be very, very similar to its ancestors. Um, so you can use mitochondrial DNA to really track and track quickly uh, the 
kind of lineage that you are, whatever lineage you're studying. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about is reclassification of fig warts, which is like, <laughs> I don't know, like of all the things, um, this is what IB wants you to know about. So fig warts used to be classified in one family, and I don't know how to say that, so I'm not going to say that. Um, but it was based strictly on morphology, right? What it looks like. And I had mentioned that at the beginning that we used to classify organisms based on what they looked like because we didn't have uh, the powers to do DNA um, studies and be able to track uh, mutations within DNA. So it was based on morphology. But when the use of DNA was kind of became a little bit more mainstream, it was shown that fig warts were not even remotely related to that first family and had totally different common ancestors. And so they were morphologically similar due to convergent evolution, which is that idea that they started differently, but because they had a similar environment, um, they evolved to be similar to other organisms, other flowers, um, but they're actually a totally, totally, totally different um, group of flowers and so we had to reclassify them um, and that was a big deal because the use of DNA um, is what allowed us to do that. Okay so that's it for evolution. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did.